Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for joining us here on the program as uh, we are uh, endeavoring to make things happen. That's right. Uh, we're trying to uh, make things happen a little bit at a time in our lives so as to uh, live our life's purposes, live our life's purpose. It's uh, one of those things. And through that process, we also need to take a look at who we are. And in that process, we're going to do that with our very special guest. She's returning to uh, our uh, our screens and our, our voices, our speakers. Uh, she is the author of Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint, a powerful guide to transformation through um, disentangling multi-generational patterns. And this was released uh, a year ago. Uh, in 2022, and I want to welcome to uh, the program once again, Judy Wilkins-Smith. Thank you for being with us. Hi, Richard. It is great to be back. I'll tell you, the challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, um, they, they, can really, they can really send us flying around. I have noticed in my own life. Now, I have some health conditions that everybody knows about, and I'm not ashamed of it. I do have high blood pressure, but it seems like it's come way down where it's supposed to be. And even though I'm taking the meds, it's like, wow, these are real. I'm talking under 100 over whatever it is. Whoa. Now, my wife says, who is, she's been in cardiology for over 50 years. She says, don't worry. It's still in the normal range. It's low normal, but it's still in the normal range. Right. So, pardon me, but it's my blood sugar that's gone through the roof all of a sudden in the last month. And I did read, nothing's changed. I haven't gone back on sodas. I haven't started consuming all kinds of sugars and things. But um, what has happened is uh, the stressors of life. Tell us, talk to us a little bit about this process of decoding so that we can sort of rewrite those patterns, those those you know, those things that the triggers uh, uh, cause us to fluctuate in our biology specifically. Absolutely. So so you're either living by the hormones of stress or the or your dopamine cascade. And what happens is this, your brain is telling your body a story that the body believes. And when that happens, that becomes your truth. So you say, oh, my goodness, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and your body goes, oh, and your stomach, if you watch, you'll notice your heart closes. It, so it, it doesn't want to feel. Your gut tightens, and then your brain goes on to survival. So it goes into survival mode. It's when your heart opens up again and your gut settles that your brain can start getting into creativity again. So for as long as we're in, uh, living by the biology of stress, that's the story we're telling our body. You're stressed, you're stressed. There's not enough, there's not enough. We don't know how to make ends meet. We're in trouble. And the body's going, yes, yes. And boom, you're sitting with high blood pressure and all sorts of things. When you start to tell yourself a very different story, but it's as powerful as the stressor, in fact, more powerful, that's when, when good things begin to happen. And you get those dopamine kicks. You get, you get your endorphins running around because life is good. I am happy. I have more than enough. Um, it, I love what I'm doing every day. Now, all of a sudden, that's your truth. And the body just calms down so what most of us don't realize is when we activate the the stress hormones what we're doing is we're co-creating and we're also listening to our nervous system most times you don't even know you have a nervous system but try getting somebody to trigger you and you will feel that nervous system very quickly now is it your nervous system or is it your multi-generational nervous system? Because the odds are that you're keying into both yours and theirs. So you want to look and see, is there a pattern of stress in the family? Who's stressed in the family? And if they did, 
Why is it coming to me? And the answer to that is very simple. A pattern mm -hmm. echoes all the way down to you because it's asking you to change what is no longer useful. I can attest to that statement. <clears throat> I want to stop this, this cycle. This is ridiculous. Now, here's the thing. I never had any of these problems until I moved to California and Santa Barbara specifically. Now, that's not to say that California is the cause. Don't get me wrong. But it also is where I have lived now for 17 years. Uh, I drove very little in Phoenix because I moved from Phoenix in uh, 1996. I beg your pardon, 2006. But I'd only been driving for about eight years. And I was having the time of my life like, wow, here I am on the freeway. Oh, my God, this is incredible. And I came to California. Everything was fine. And a few years after, my doctor says, uh, you got high blood pressure, buddy. Here are the meds to take. You know, and, you know, I told my wife, all right, I'll take them. Okay. <laughs> and then um, I knew that uh, after, you know, we got into the pandemic, I got diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes. And I, I kicked it in a month and a half. Okay. I'm thinking, great. Now I still have to watch what I eat and drink and so forth. And I know that no sodas, you know, no ex extra sugars. Everything's been going along fine until these last couple of months. And all of a sudden it's like through the roof. Now, when I say through the roof, you know, 200s, 300s, and people are going, oh my God, that's, you know, well, just relax. Okay. That's, <laughs> I'm still here and I'm doing what I need to do to, 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 to make the changes necessary. And I'm willing to do that, but I would rather do it non-medically. I would rather do it non-pharmaceutically. And it sounds to me like you have a method through this decoding process that helps people to um, to do just that. Am I correct? Yeah, really, it's about looking at, so what is stressing you? What is causing that spike right now? And again, is it a pattern that comes from the past or is it your own unique pattern? Did anybody else have high sugar? Um, when did that happen for them? Because quite often we will mimic that at around the same time as it happened for a parent or a grandparent or someone with whom we're or by whom we're very seriously affected or impacted. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is you want to look at, so what are my thoughts? What are my feelings? What are my actions? And then you want to write down when I have high blood sugar, I feel, I think I do. And then, so how can I feel? think differently because as I think a new thought differently and as I allow the body to just calm itself down and come all the way back to normal I am actually stronger than the biology of belief I am stronger than my beliefs about my body it's really about getting the mind to tell the body the story the body needs for it to just come all the way down and think about it Richard yeah, I, I know for me, if somebody says to me, you know, if you want to be to, if you want to be well, all you got to do is relax. I could smack them. Do you know <laughs> how hard it is to <laughs> relax? <laughs> when you're sitting all up tight there and somebody's saying to you, just relax. Dude, if I <laughs> if I was relaxed, this would be good. But it's it's that simple and it's not that simple. We're yeah. so busy telling our bodies a story that's not good for us that suddenly we have everything go wackadoodle. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. It and understand the pattern. And then what you do is exactly what you did with your diabetes thing. I can control this. I can do this using food and I, I wisely. And But my question would go back to who in your family was a type 2 diabetic? Or had issues that were similar? Was it mom? Was it dad? Grandpa? Grandma? Because if it's there at all, you want to actually also just park it back with them. You have what we call an unconscious loyalty to the ones who came before you. And so you're sharing that that nervous system or, or that pattern. And you want to decouple from it. How much of this is embedded in our DNA, and I, I want to add something to that that I saw just the other day regarding microplastics. And they are saying in this one piece I was looking at that these microplastics are actually altering our human DNA. And we don't know exactly how, 
right. but it's altering it. But e are you also speaking, microplastics aside, are you also speaking about the process of rewriting our DNA? So the, the short answer to that yeah. is yes. Um, you have physical DNA and you have emotional DNA. Your emotional DNA is your pattern of thoughts, feelings, and actions. And they're inherited from many generations ago. They come down a couple of ways. You can, you can start with emotional DNA three ways. Either you are its creator. In other words, there's an event that's happened to you and you've had the thoughts, feelings, actions, reactions, and it's significant. Or it comes from your ancestors, in which case, if it's significant enough, it will create an impact on the, the, the genetic uh, code or genetic trigger, rather, not code, genetic trigger. So it begins to trigger what will switch on and what, what will not switch on. So that's the other way. And um, then the third way that you can create emotional DNA is from what you hear and what was said and what was done. So grandfather did this, dad did this, I do this. Grandfather said this, dad said this, I say this. So those are your three ways of creating it. Now, the most important thing about emotional DNA is that unlike physical DNA, where we don't know yet how to control it or work with it, with emotional DNA, yes, we do. It's one new thought, one new feeling, one new action at a time. And as we do that, you then get into the world. So, so the, the event that creates it is epigenetic. The rewiring of what's encoded is neuroscientific. What you're doing is you're you're creating one new thought, one new feeling, one new action, and you keep rehearsing that and you keep refining that, but you've got to feel it because if you don't, it's just a head exercise. The body's got to say yes. When the body says yes, and by the way, you often use an elevated emotion to do that, not amplified, elevated. When the body says yes, that becomes the new truth. And so you can recode. Now, is it strong enough to recode your, your um, physical DNA? What it does do is it recodes the markers. And so, again, whether you will activate them or not activate them, because we know they're all there. The triggers are all there. The gun is loaded. This is, do we pull the trigger or do we not? So the simple answer to your question is yes. Mm. <clears throat> and we're doing that, in essence, uh, every day anyway, uh, just by living our lives and doing the things we're doing. And absolutely, in this sense, ingesting those microplastics and so forth and so on. We're talking here about uh, decoding. That's right. We're talking about decoding uh, your emotional blueprint. We're going to talk more about this with our very special guest. And her name is Judy Wilkins-Smith. The name of this program of course, is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is a great pleasure to have uh, Judy Wilkins-Smith back with us here on the program to talk about this aspect of decoding uh, the uh, uh, the blueprint, uh, the emotional blueprint. I've often said it, uh, Judy, that um, we are all alike in the uh, aspect of emotion, we all experience the same emotions. Yes, different intensities, but we all experience fear and happiness and ang angst and anger and joy and bliss and so on and so forth. Um, but again, it, it's, it's the intensity and those intensities are all based upon the stories that are behind those emotions. And what the body believes. And what the body, okay, and what the body believes. So <clears throat> I have a story of a situation where I was in a non-injury automobile accident many several years ago that actually turned out to be very positive. And I really worked hard even at that moment to stay out of the angst, to stay out of the fear, to the stay out of the frustration, because I also knew that that wasn't going to help the situation. So what I did was I would tell myself, just relax. Okay, everything's, you're all right. And the other driver's okay. There are no injuries here. 
And at the end, I walked up to the gentleman and I shook his hand and I says, hey, I'm glad that we're both okay. Now let's go out and make it a better day than this. Okay. And like I said, it's not to say that that was a, a terrible experience because it really wasn't. It, it I don't know how w- what direction his life took after that. I know only of mine where we were able to, within a month, uh, purchase a, a truck that we'd been wanting for a long time. And it seemed like, ah, okay, so if I just, you know, just tone it down, Absolutely. then things are different. Now, the truck, unfortunately, about a month ago, was involved in an accident that totaled it. Oh, my. And it was a non-injury. Fortunately, no one was hurt, and uh, unfortunately, the vehicle was totaled. Well, I'm now driving a different vehicle, which I really kind of like, you know. But at the time, I was very, I was still very frustrated. I really did try, but I wasn't that successful at toning down the 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 frustration uh, and so forth. And thinking about, okay, so I filed a claim. Now they're going to give us 30 days on the rental. And we're getting to the end of the 30 days. What am I going to do? We don't have a vehicle. We don't, you know. And I just, it was one of those situations where I had to throw up my hands and say, all right, universe, I'm trying. I'm really trying to trust here. I'm really trying. And, you know, and yes, it's working out well, but it just seems like, I think I have expectations. Matter of fact, I don't think I know. I have these certain expectations that I want this resolved quicker, sooner, faster. Um, is that a problem that we have that we we have those that's a, that's part of the issue. We have these expectations. And it's hard to let those expectations go if you're not in a particular mindset. And I want to talk about that what mindset we want to get into but is that is that sort of the 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 crux of the issue well the expectations is nothing wrong with in fact i like expectations i also like that you were frustrated because if you're frustrated it tells you that you're in a box that's too small for you and it wants a different pattern you've accessed that pattern before because the first time you could relax completely and look at your outcome The second time you couldn't relax completely and look at your outcome. Whether what's the one as good as the other. When we can relax, what we do is instead of shutting down creativity, we open up to creativity. In your first one, you actually did it. You said, okay, let's make this good. Let's just all breathe. Let's find the positive. And so guess what? You did. When you looked for the frustration because you were really riled up and you you had 30 days on it and, 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 you were not looking for the positive. And so you didn't find it. So it's very much about in the moment we don't recognize every single day we're making choices, but we're making them completely unconsciously. It's just, it's reactive. It's when you start being creative and conscious and conscious of what you want, that those expectations will be met quicker because mm-hmm. you're not going to shut down and or, or resist. And uh, I have people say, well, I'm not resisting. I want the million bucks now. <laughs> okay. I didn't hear any resistance in that whatsoever. Not at all. Not a bit. Yeah. Yeah. We are resisting. We're, we're saying I want it, but you have one foot on the accelerator, the other one on the brake, and you're wondering why you're going around in circles. For decoding, what you I can remember when they um, when they diagnosed my mother with cancer. Mm-hmm. I can remember walking out into the hallway and going, "This is her journey. You're going to walk it with her, but this is not you. Do not make an unwise choice with your thoughts right now." Be very careful of what you're thinking right now. Be very careful of what you're feeling. Be very careful of your actions because that is about to become your new truth. What do you want? Interesting. Very, very interesting. And it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. What do we want? And then get your foot off the brake. Yeah. Yeah, as a, you know, it's it's funny too when I think about what you just said. I think about people 
actually driving. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And I'm coming down. We're, we're, we're driving uphill. All right. I'm going home. I'm driving uphill. Why would you ever need to use your brake going uphill? And what I do is, let's just say traffic slows down in front of me and I keep a good distance. I just let my foot off the accelerator and I let gravity do its job. So I don't need to. And the same thing coming down still. I'll put it in low gear. I'll put it in third, if you will. And I just let the vehicle do its thing. The motor is there as a governor to regulate my speed. Now, if I need to use the brakes, I certainly will. But it's one of the things that my mechanic has actually been really surprised about when they go to look at our brakes, how old the car is, how many miles it has on it. Really? You still have a good 75% on there. And, you know, we've been driving it for a year, year and a half, and you'd think it'd be worn. And I'll bet you that some of the people that are coming down that pass where I live up on the 154 here in Santa Barbara, I'll bet you they have to have their brakes done every year, year and a half because they ride their brakes up and down that hill. Yeah. And, and how do they feel? Because think about the times when you've got to hit the brakes. Mm -hmm. <gasps> well, if you're in, <gasps> the universe can't get through to you. Forget it. It no. can't do it. Not going to happen. You're too busy having shut down all the avenues. It goes, oh, well, let's just wait till he wakes up again. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Wait till he wakes up again. Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I'm really working hard at all of this. And I know that a lot of other people are doing the work they need to do in their lives to, you know, to do, to help with the issues that they're dealing with as well and, and to continue to move forward. And Thank yet you, I yeah. still, I'm still doing lots of stuff. I'm still accomplishing things. And there are days like even this day, and you, as you and I are talking, uh, where there is um, uh, 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 there has been an excessive amount of overwhelm because there have been so many tasks that need to be taken right. care of. And here I am at the end of this particular day as you and I are conversing. This is the last, well, it's sort of the second to last activity. And it's like, okay, I'm able to, I'm not going to go back too far here, but I'm able to relax a little bit and and really enjoy this conversation we're having here with uh, Judy Wilkins Smith on Tell Me Your Story. Judy Wilkins .com is the website here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and we're talking about decoding that emotional blueprint of yours and mine. Um, what is the? I know that that the first the first real step in any aspect of growth is that we have to acknowledge and we have to say, I'm going to do the work. I know it isn't going to necessarily be, you know, uh, all Skittles and beer or anything like that. It's going to be easy. It's not about easy. It's about learning about self. So once I have recognized, shall we say that uh, I need help. All right. And let's say I choose to decode my emotional blueprint through your process. We've that's step one. What's step two? Now what? Actually, so the first step is not I need help. It's I want more. Ah. I want more. The, um, and I talk a lot about possibility thinking, and people go, that's wishful thinking. No, it's not. You don't do anything in your life without investing in the possibility. The minute you do anything, there is a possibility that, but it's conscious possibility thinking. So you have to want more because if you don't want more, you're going to stay sitting exactly where you are. So your first step is, I want more. And then it is, so where am I stuck? When did that start for me? What was happening in my life at the time? What have I made it mean about me? What have I made it mean about others? Now, so that's the irritation piece. Then the other one that says, I really want, I really would like, I so wish that. When you have that real heart's desire and you invest in that, it'll pull you beyond your excuses for sitting still and it'll pull you into the world of possibilities. So you've got to want more. And this begins as, as 
for human beings, it's always in place, but it begins as a baby. You don't get up and just walk. You get up because there's a rattle or, a, or something on the other side of the room and you want it. I want more. So I teach people very much, don't want less, want more. The more you want, the better it is for the planet. You're expanding it all the time. But sit down and be conscious about what you're creating. Don't get to the end of the day and say, well, I couldn't help that. Yeah, you could help that. You could. You chose it. So be aware of what you're choosing. Be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of your feelings. Be aware of your actions. Mm. I want to ask you about, <clears throat> because there's a huge controversy, especially in this country, in general, this is what's so weird, in general, about science. Yes. What is the scientific evidence of emotional DNA? Two. And I mentioned, actually, there's, there's, the, the, the scientific ones would rest on two. You've got um, epigenetics and good studies in epigenetics. In fact, if, if people want to find out more, they need to go and look at the, the Great Dutch Hunger Winter. Really well researched. And... Um, Rachel Yehuda, I think, who's done a number of articles on, on this epigenetic inheritance. And neuroscience, it's the rewiring of the brain. Once upon a time, people would say, they don't say it around me anymore, but they would say, this is the way I am. I'm X number of years old, and that's just the way I am. No, it's not. You're choosing that. Because at any moment, you can rewire your brain, and that is very well studied. Neuroplasticity is well studied, but it's also the interplay between the, the brain and rewiring it and also opening the heart and the gut because the head-heart-gut connection, when you achieve um, alignment between the three, when the gut goes, we're good, and the heart goes, I'm so open, the brain is open to creating well, and the head-heart-gut alignment Put you into a state of coherence. Now you don't have your foot on that brake anymore. Now everything is saying yes, and you're able, your brain is able to tell your body that story that your body needs to hear and say yes to, and you're off to the races. Hmm. I remember thinking about this, especially in terms of our DNA. <clears throat> when a baby is born, the relatives will look at that child and say, oh, that exactly. child has so-and-so's eyes, ears, nose, et cetera, et cetera. As the child grows, uh, the child exhibits certain behaviors. Right. And, oh, my goodness, he has his so-and-so's laugh and uh, so-and-so's uh, frustration, anger, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, okay, so now the kid's now in school and has an aptitude for a particular subject. Oh, just like Aunt Jean or or Uncle Fred exactly. or Grandpa, you know, and so on and so forth. And I thought, okay, well, can the same thing be said for the spiritual aspect of an individual? Or is that unique in that that is truly uniquely that individual's? Or is there something in the DNA as far as we know? Is, is there any... Evidence oh, they, no, they will be. Think about it fairly logically. Mm -hmm. If I grow up a Muslim, I'm going to have one way of looking at something. Mm -hmm. If I grow up Jewish, I'll have another way. And if I grow up Christian, I'll have yet a third way. But the nuances of that, that are particular to me, will be only mine based on the thoughts, feelings and actions. Now, it takes quite a lot of courage because we are so raised on systems and systemic words and things that operate within our cultures, within our family systems, within our careers. We're pretty much conditioned to this is the way it is. It's the person who goes, what if it weren't, who starts something different? It's the person who says, I have um, imposter syndrome. No, you don't. You have pioneer syndrome. Those are the people who begin to take it in a different direction. And so, of course, the next thing you know is they're there. And we're doing we do this all day long. They're borrowing from the quantum field, because any time you observe a new pattern into reality. 
you just touched into the quantum field. Mm -hmm. So now we we are able to be incredible co-creators when we wake up. When we wake up. So we're going to talk more about that and some other areas as well as we continue talking with Judy Wilkins-Smith. JudyWilkinsmith.com is the website, Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint. The book, I'm Richard Dugan. This is Tell Me Your Story. We're talking about uh, this uh, blueprint uh, that... I guess we are the ones, we are the architects. The architect is the one that actually draws out the blueprint. So we are our own architect. Um, I want to let everybody also know that uh, every human being is born to be remarkable. And yet every human being is shaped by patterns handed down by their ancestors. Invisible, multi-generational patterns of Decisions, thoughts, feelings, actions, inactions, reactions, and choices that limit their responses to events and influence every decision of their lives, unnecessarily running the show. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting you talk about choices here because that's what we talk about, choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true, we're bringing all of these different things to the what we call our smorgasbord, our big old table. Love it. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger every time we do another program. Even when we have returning guests such as yourself, the table still gets bigger and bigger. Um, it is said that we are where we are because of the choices we've made in the past, and we will be where we will be in the future based upon the choices we make today. And um, what's added to that now for me is, and those choices that I will make today were, are going to be based upon my perception of what I think the future will be. For you. My perception. Yes. For me. For me, exactly. Yes. It's very personal, very individual, very subjective in that regard. So if I'm a pessimist, I may be digging a Good hole luck. in the ground. Now, you know, I may be digging a hole in the ground and stuffing a bunch of food down there so that I can survive the disaster that I think is coming. Or if I'm an optimist, I'm not going to be digging a hole in the ground. I'm going to be living my life and trying to do my best to thrive up here on the surface. And it's that ladder that I want to be. And I want to share that with other people. And I know that's what you want to do, too. How did you come up with this aspect of, first of all, the emotional blueprint? and realizing that it can be decoded? Uh, I think doing systemic work in constellations for a long time, uh, it was sort of as a healing practice or a he healing modality. But the more I worked with people, the more I realized that, yes, it was healing, but people would say, and then what? And the and then what is, is where I began to play with the emotional DNA. Because that emotional DNA that you've inherited is there as a gift. It gives you your purpose when you understand what you're looking for. And so it was very much about playing in the field of transformation and moving moving the modality to that. Uh, I think that that just simply evolved over a period of time with people saying, that's good. I now know great uncle so-and-so did this, which is why I do the same. But what do I do with that? Mm hmm why Why me? Well, the why me is because the pattern is asking to change and it's looking at you and it's saying to you, you can do this. When you understand who went missing or what was unresolved or excluded and you give it its place, the symptoms have done their job. Now you're free to go and do something entirely different. Well, I'll tell you, I, it's, it, it is phenomenal how far we have come, and I don't mean that in terms of the human race, I mean in terms of the science that you are talking about now, that is <clears throat> that is something that many people have been researching for, for decades, if not for centuries. Uh, you know, the great philosophers and so forth, they're trying to figure it out just like the rest of us. When it comes to this, this um, I, I, I actually wanted to ask you about... A particular element that you've actually touched upon already. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, what is systemic systemic work, as well as because you mentioned these sort of in the same breath, uh, constellation. Yeah. So what? systemic work is the study of you within your system, your family system. Right. You didn't happen in a vacuum. 
True. You came from many, 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 many. So we don't just look at you. We look at where did that come from? What was the precipitating event? Who displayed it first? How has it affected the family system? How has it affected you? How are you going to use it to pivot and create a strength? So um, that's systemic work. And a constellation is the most incredible thing. I, it, it's, a, it's a process where if you were to come to me and say, I struggle with X, I would ask you, what are the components of that issue? So maybe it's mom, maybe it's dad, maybe it's sister and brother and, and you. And I would say, choose a representative for each one. And then what we do is we use those representatives. And I say to you, okay, Richard, I want you to set them up in relationship to each other the way it is for you regarding this issue. So you give me a picture. You'll say, well, maybe dad's over here and mom's in the middle and I'm right near mom and sister's off in the distance. And, and so I'll begin to ask you questions. So, so what's dad looking at? Why is he distant? Where, where did he go? Well, you know, he never really came back from the war intact. He's still sort of out there somewhere. So maybe I put a representative in for the war. And that representative for dad calms down or just settles. But we begin to get this whole 3D picture, and it's a very accurate picture of what's happening for you. In addition to that, we've discovered that people are very accurate sensors, and they can pick up what's in systems. So a representative may say to me, um, I'm, I'm feeling very angry or very sad or, or say something in particular, and, I, and you look at me and say, Wait a bit, how'd they know how to say that? That's what my dad always said. We're very accurate at it. And of course, that gets people confused and they say, how's that possible? Here's how. If you've ever watched American Idol, America's Got Talent, The Voice, and somebody suddenly gets that and has that moment and you've got goosebumps and you're sitting at home, you just sensed into their system. We're very capable of doing it. But here... We use it to make the unconscious conscious and the invisible visible. So we're teaching you how to use that sensing into the system to explore your issue in 3D. And because it, we're engaging so many senses, it becomes an embodied experience, the aha experience, and you begin rewiring very quickly in the moment. And that is called a constellation. Mm. Makes me think, uh, and I've shared this with others, there's a picture that was displayed at my father's memorial back uh, last March 10th. And it was a picture of him looking over my mother's shoulder, uh, actually oh, not only over her shoulder, but over the, the back of what looked like maybe a couch or a love seat or something. And she was opening a package that he gave her. And he's kind of leaning off to the side a little bit. And he is just grinning from ear to ear. He is probably more excited than she is about what she is about to find inside this package. And one of the things that was said by my sisters, because they were around him a lot more than I have been, being living here in California, they said that he, and I saw this as a kid growing up too, he doted on my mother. Now, I was sharing this with my wife, my present wife, and I said, I, I, the, maybe that's where I get it from, too, because I want to do things. For, she's always asking me, why is it that when I ask you for something, you say, okay, sure, let's do that, or okay, I can do that for you, and so on and so forth, no matter how I'm feeling. I mean, even if I'm dead tired, I'll, I, I love making tea for her in the morning on the weekends. My father would make my mother breakfast every morning. That's one of the things my mother says wow. she's she's going to miss. But he got it from somewhere. I don't know if he got it from his father or if it was, as you are uh, saying, it was embedded in his DNA and he just brought it out, so to speak, right? because of how he how he felt for my mother. So either he inherited that emotional DNA and it was expressed as this love for wife, which is fabulous because it makes such a difference to the kids, or he was the creator of it. And perhaps before him, there was something that he saw that was not good and went, I'm not doing it that way. I'm doing it this way. And the minute he did that, 
he started switching out the emotional DNA. Mm -hmm. So it's either in collusion with or reaction to what we see. In collusion with is common. In reaction to and consciously is less common. But it's when we invest in the uncommon that the uncommon occurs. Mm -hmm. And so now he's passed that down to you. And I don't know if you have children or not, but or, or nephews or nieces, it may pass to one of them. If they watch it and they go, look how close they are. I want that. Now, do you hear what I just said? I want. Okay. So now they want more. But here's the here's the question for you, and that is, could that come about because of the DNA and not so much because he uh because he watched this he 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 was absolutely absolutely okay. if it expressed further back if there was someone further back who was that way it will come down and express again mm. often in a limiting pattern but not always and if it's a strong pattern it's an interesting thing because i see this with with people who struggle with money and I would say to them, was there no one in your family who, who did well with money? Oh, yes, uncle so-and-so. So so how come we're aligned with this? Well, because this one, you know, this one is, wow, they suffered. And I go, okay, so why are we aligned with that? Well, because we've also been taught that suffering is sacred. Have you were born and raised Catholic or in many cases even Jewish? <laughs> Muslim, any of those. We have yeah. this. We have this feeling that suffering is sacred. Now, yeah. we're all going to suffer at some point, and it may teach us some profound lessons. Mm -hmm. But if you stew in it, it shifts from sacred to stupid. And you don't want to do that. It isn't. Suffering is, is a helpful tool if you want to learn. But here's the other thing that I would offer. As much as suffering can be sacred, no arguments, have you ever sat and watched something so profoundly beautiful or or something that made you so happy that it changed you? Mm. Because if yeah. you did, you've now discovered that there is another way to transform. You do not have to suffer. You can actually bliss your way into transformation. When yeah. you notice the beauty around you, when your heart is touched by the happy or the profound, you're as capable of transforming that way as you are of suffering that way. Mm. And, you know, there have been experiences in my life recently uh, that have been profound, that have changed me. Obviously, um, the the events of loss in one's life are going to change them. I, my eldest sister's passing. Uh, but my father and the thing that I am so proud of being able to say in regards to my father, is that he and I, we said everything that needed to be said. There was nothing between us. There's none of this, oh, if only I had told him this or that or the other thing. Um, and the ability to have been able to speak with him and again, say those same words to him literally 24 hours before his, I'll call it his departure. <laughs> departure date. For yes. Planet X. In deference to uh, Dr. Bernie Siegel, who says, no, die. They died. Uh, why can't we just say that? Um, I respect Dr. Siegel very much. At the same time, um, there's the, the body actually stops functioning. And if you want to use that as the criterion for dying, yes. But that which is truly important, that which is really us, is there a part of that element of us, that spiritual aspect, yes, that may indeed uh, be um, impacted, can we put it that way, by or influenced by our physical DNA, that strand of information. When we leave the body, I would think that that DNA doesn't have the same kind of influence because now we're disconnected from the physical body. And as far as we know, you're, you're not carrying that with you in spirit. I mean, we don't know, but... I don't know, but here's the thing. You will still be connected in some way, You or you will have had the impact in some way mm -hmm. on that family line. So you will be connected to that family line. 
Mm. Now, what that looks like, I really don't know. But think about it this way. You're, and you'll have seen this on, on TV. Somebody asks somebody about their mother and tears run. The impact of mom is still there, even though she died 20 years ago. Their impact is still there. They have that impact on the system that doesn't go away. Yeah. I I shared uh, not long ago in a program um, my encounter, <clears throat> uh, interaction, I should say, with my father, uh, the night of my sister's uh, memorial. And um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the exchange that he and I had uh, as I was getting ready to go to bed and I'm sharing the story and for the first time, and I'd shared it already 15, 20, 30 times, and I started to tear up and choke up as I'm sharing this element of, of my the connection with my father. And I'm going, where, where did that come from? You know, I haven't felt that way like that until this very moment. And obviously, it had to some, had something to do with the conversation that I was having with the person uh, on this particular program. So... There's so many things that can trigger us. I I have to say that we get the marine layer, for example, here in Santa Barbara, and as it's burning off and you still have those puffy clouds around, but it's still the marine layer, but it's lightened up and the sun is coming through. It reminds me of those times when <clears throat> my first wife and I, when she would go on uh, uh, chorus tours or what have you in, in our high school, um, we went to SeaWorld and that was the way the sky was when we were there. Wow. We had a really nice time. So it's like, those kinds of of triggers, I guess that's what we refer to them as, that bring those memories back. And I have to say, and I'm thankful that I have more good memories that come back than I do bad. I Absolutely. Think I think it's more because, and this is something that I'd like you to address, because I have focused more on the positive, more on the good um, they they used to say, I, I, I remember when I was working for the Christian station and they were always talking about, oh, and the devil this and the devil that. And I remember someone telling me, says, if you're looking for the devil under every rock, guess what? You're going to find you're him. You're going to find him. Oh, yeah. But if you look for good or God under every rock, guess what? You're going to find him or it, if you will, that good. And I'd rather look for the good. Um, and uh, in that, we are talking with... Judy Wilkins Smith. Judy Wilkins com is the website and decoding your emotional blueprint is the book. And this is tell me your story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And it is always a pleasure to have returning guests such as yourself, Judy, to talk about these kinds of things. What is the dynamic that existed in the past with your immediate family, and as you began to dive into this science and this research of yours, the systemic, uh, t uh, the systemic work, and the, co the the constellations, and of course the decoding, how did the relationships in your life change? Gosh, I think in many ways we were very close. I would say, if I'm looking for a pattern that was there, it would probably have been. Don't be greedy. We were always taught, don't be greedy, don't be greedy. Bearing in mind that my grandparents had been through the Second World War, my mom was sort of the, the tail end of that coming out. Um, and we were very mindful, you can have two of that, you don't need all of that, don't be greedy. And I think as I started getting into this, this work more, I realized there's a difference between greed and appetite. Mm -hmm. Greed doesn't do much for you and it doesn't do much for anyone else. But appetite, appetite pushes the envelope, uh, envelope. It, it invites people to, to want more and do more and be more. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I would really rather that we had an appetite for life, that we, we did less around being victims and uh, that we did. And look, again, we're always we're going to get into some people are going to be victims. We're all going to be a victim at one point or another. But how are we using that? And are we using it? Are we climbing out from that and learning something that we can use? But I think most of all, I would say it's the want a lot that changed for me before it was be satisfied, be grateful, which I am, I'm extremely grateful. But for goodness sake, if you were given a brain and you're able to uh, co-create, 
then want a lot because every time that you expand, so does everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's something that I love too. When somebody else is growing or succeeding, I think more and more I shift from going, well, I'd like to be there too. They're doing it. If they can take a step, it's, it's expanding everything for all of us. This is great. So I don't see greed. I see appetite. Someone also defined uh, when we I was talking, we were talking about capitalism. And the one thing they didn't think about, they didn't consider, they didn't put into the equation was greed. And I use the word greed. They said, well, not that's really not the right word. It's not greed. It's envy. It's envy. Yeah, envy is actually such an interesting thing because when you envy, you're not focused on your journey. You're focused on someone else's. Mm -hmm. And that's a little useless, frankly. It's not going to get you where you want to be. Yeah. It's the, the only really not good thing about envy is that it's a, it's a distraction. Well, I can tell you that uh, on this particular day with the number of tasks before me, and I knew getting up in the morning they were there, uh, I didn't have time to think about anything else but taking on each task throughout the day. Uh, I can only imagine how inefficient and uh, ineffectual, if you will, I would have been if I was thinking about somebody else who didn't have all these tasks, who maybe was retired or this or that or the other thing, or my brother who travels you know, he's he's spending a lot of time, I think, in Vietnam, between the Vietnam and the United States. And 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 if my mind was there, I can only imagine how bad, how the, the how low the productivity would have been in those tasks. Well, you'd have been living by the biology of stress and and telling yourself all sorts of stories that you believed, like, I'm not worthy, I'm an idiot. How did I wind up here? Why has he got more? Why have I got less? And that's going to help you do what you want to do. How? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's when I when I hear people on the radio or television, the commentators, the talk show hosts on either side of the political aisle, for example, complaining about the other side. I, I sometimes I will yell at the television. How is that helping to solve the problems well, you say we have? It's really not. I don't understand. Well, yeah, it isn't. And if we would, if we would all do three things politically, we'd be good. I mean, I don't see it at the moment. I yeah. guess I have to start looking. But if we would listen, if we would be kind, and if we would have manners, we could all arrive at a pretty good point. Yeah, yeah. They. Uh, it's a shame they don't sell common sense uh, at the local convention. It is neither common nor do they have much <laughs> of the other. This is true. This is true. Um, I was sharing in one interview about how uh, my job is not to uh, to uh, to bring out the foibles in other people or to show uh, them uh, show that they are wrong or anything. My my part of what I do is to say, would you at least consider thinking about it from a different perspective? Because if you take your logic to its final conclusion, it doesn't make sense it just doesn't make sense uh it's like um i keep i i would constantly be hearing this phrase for example uh, on the political level about how these people that that are elected to the various offices across the country as well as in dc you know that they're there to serve the people and in the capitol hill for example that's the people's house they call it right the people's house and that the people inside are supposed to be doing the people's business but when i hear all of the moaning and groaning and complaining and so on and on and on i'm going how do you how is that the people's business the people Thanks of which not. i am one we don't care we want you no. to deal with the issues that that we want you to deal with and not what you think and i'm not saying that that we are controlling them but this is where that whole concept of common sense comes in but doesn't exist in that rarefied air apparently i have a very very easy solution put them all in the ge building in bunk beds 
give them one happy meal a day and tell them they don't get out until they've solved the mess and they can talk to each other. I'm with yeah. you. I'm with you there. I'm with you there. <laughs> I, I think that's a that's a very good solution. We're talking with uh, Judy Wilkins Smith. JudyWilkinsSmith.com is the website. This is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And uh, Judy, I want to thank you for giving us so much time here on the program for uh, uh, another wonderful conversation. And I hope that that people will pick up a copy of. Uh, the book that uh, that you have uh, so uh, diligently put together, it is called Decoding Your Emotional Blueprint. It's a powerful guide to transformation through, and this is an interesting word, disengagement, multi-generational patterns. We hope that you'll pick up a copy. You can get it through a lot of different, the Amazon and so forth, but you can also get it through her website, which is Judy Wilkins. Oh, and by the way, I should uh, clarify that's Judy Wilkins hyphen Smith, but don't worry about it. We'll be linked to her website. So all you have to do is click on it and uh, away you go. So we hope that you'll do that. Judy, uh, I asked you the last time. I'm going to ask you again this time because, well, it's just what we do here on the program. Those three final questions that I asked you the last time. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story. New paradigms for a new world. We're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m., streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We're on podcasts on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, many other locations, as well as YouTube, where you can watch these interviews. I hope you'll click on the notification button to at least be notified when a new conversation is posted on either the podcast or the videocast websites. And um, we also ask that if you can support us financially, we would greatly appreciate that. We do have a PayPal account. It is there for your security as well as ours. And when they uh, ask you to uh, put in the email address to whom you are sending this uh, financial support to, it's richard at richarddugan.com, richard at richarddugan.com. And we thank you, thank you, thank you for those who have helped and those who will help. And we also ask that you spend time going within to that quiet, still, calm, peaceful place and listening to that still, small voice. And with that, we now go to uh, back to our guest and ask those three questions. And the first of those is, who is Judy Wilkins Smith? Judy Wilkins Smith is an incredible optimist, a co-creator, more conscious these days than not, hopefully. Um, very firmly rooted in the belief that if we're willing to look we can create incredible lives and that we are indeed incredible lives if only we know how to see it. What is your life's purpose? Uh, my life's purpose very much is to, to bring to people's attention the fun, the magic, the transformation, the joy of living and your capability of bringing that about. And finally, what was your best day? What was my best day? Every day is the best day. Mm. I love it. I love it. Still reminds me of Labor Day 2000, uh, 1993. Uh, and I had that first best day. And then every day after that for almost an entire month was my best day. So I couldn't agree with you more. I thank you again for joining us here on the program. I look forward to talking with you again. Have you anything new in the works uh, in terms of uh, any more uh, books or materials, articles, videos, etc.? I have a couple coming up soon, um, and they will show you more about your genealogy uh, and interactive genealogy. So you're going to discover that your genealogy isn't just about how you belong, where you belong. It's about how you belong and why that matters. And then um, a couple of things. I have a Dallas event and a Houston event coming up, one in June, June 23rd in Houston. I believe it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then November the 5th through the 8th, I have Money DNA at Disney World. And that's four days of learning to find, identify, 
and recode your money DNA. And people who attend that don't just go away richer in soul. They tend to go away and become richer in pocket. I would love to attend that if it were possible. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, and it, I'm glad it's in November when it's cooler. <laughs> oh, yeah. You will not find me at Disney World when it's hotter. It is. <laughs> let's just say my favorite time is cooler. Absolutely. You, you and me both. Well, Judy, thank you again for joining us here on the program. And I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story. New paradigms for a new world again as we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. Until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to lull. Jeanette, I am listening. And Dad, be happy. <laughs>